<clears throat> Brother Monty said it's good, it's truly good to be here, it's truly good to be in the house of the Lord on the first day of the week, on the Lord's day. And as Brother Monty I mentioned, the invitation song. The invitation song would be number 703. Number 703. <clears throat> it's good to be here. <laughs> uh, as Brother Monty mentioned, uh, the topic of the morning is is uh, putting off and putting on or as I've said dressing for Christian success so um, and we'll, we'll talk more about that as we go along here and if I can get my clicker to work which I can't get my clicker to work but this works so as we've gone through this series of of lessons studies over the past couple of months we started with the uh, the Great Comm Commission and 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 everything from that point has built upon the message of the Great Commission where Jesus said all authority in heaven and earth is given unto me go ye therefore speaking to his apostles into all the world preach the gospel to every creature make disciples of them baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost and teach them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you and so we've we've taken those principles as we looked at the Great Commission as Jesus, as is recorded in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we've expounded on that. So the importance of the Great Commission, um, the direction that Jesus gave concerning the spreading of the gospel and the, the responsibility of those who heard if they would believe and obey and be saved. We talked, Brother John talked about saving faith. And we, in conclusion, that saving faith is obedient faith. And when we read in the New Testament, when the Bible, when Paul or Peter or the, the writers of the, of the New Testament talk about faith, it is implied that that is obedient faith. And, you know, there's a couple of verses we could point to just off the top of my head that Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you don't do the things that I say? You see, if we have faith in Jesus, we need to believe his word and we need to do the things that he said. John said, if we say that we know him, but we do not keep his commandments, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. So the implied structure, the implied definition of faith in the New Testament is a faith that believes and obeys what God has called us to do. Brother Monty talked, about, talked to us about the doctrine of baptism, the who, the why, the when, and the where about baptism. You know, that was very, very um, important component of the Great Commission that Jesus told his apostles that to go out and to preach the gospel and those who believed and were baptized would be saved. The other thing that is implied from Acts 2 forward is when you read about someone being a believer or having believed, it is implied that they are a baptized believer. And I think when we remember those two things, obedient faith and baptized believers, it takes out a lot of the confusion of the New Testament where people would try to imply otherwise in those verses. <clears throat> We talked about salvation in Christ. We talked about the fact that the sacrifice of Jesus, the blood of the cross flowed backward and forward. It was the means of forgiveness for all people of all time, whether before the cross or after the cross. And we talked about the fact that that event, the greatest event in human history, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ was the dividing point from the Old Testament to the New. G um, Ian talked, about, talked to us about the authority of Christ, the fact that all authority in heaven and earth was given to Jesus. And therefore, the words of the New Testament are the authoritative word of Jesus Christ. Whether they were spoken by him or by others through the direction of the Holy Spirit, that is the authoritative word of God. And that we as human beings have no authority to change what God has said. <clears throat> John last week talked to us no, a week before last, talked to us about the fact that Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. 
He is the ruler of all and he is the ruler in our lives. He is Lord of our lives. He has command and control of, of us as his servants. He is our Lord. Brother Justin talked to us about commitment. That once we start the Christian life, we have turned our back on, on, the, old, on the old ways, on the old person. There is no place to turn back once we start that walk. That Jesus is committed to us. He will never leave us nor forsake us. And we too are committed to him to see this through, to continue the walk, to finish the course. And so this morning, we're going to talk about putting on and put, putting off. So there's, there are several places in the New Testament, in the writings of Paul, in the writings of Peter, and even in the book of Revelation that talks about the fact that we are clothed with Christ, that we are clothed with certain things. It refers to our new life as a Christian as putting off or, or taking off the deeds of the old person as we take off, our, take off clothes. You know, the Old Testament refers to our righteousness as filthy rags. And so before we came to Christ, we were clothed in filthy rags. And that old person, that old man, was clothed in filthy rags. But when we become a new cre creation in Jesus Christ, that we are clothed with something new. We are clothed with Christ. And so we're going we're gonna to talk this morning about uh, some of the writings of Paul, specifically in the book of Colossians, that tell us about how we navigate this new life in Christ and, and putting off the old and putting on the new. Before we do that, I want to talk about something that we've already covered, but I think, it's, I think it's important to just summarize this. What happens when we are baptized into Christ, when we become that new person in Christ? Number one, we receive the forgiveness of sins or salvation, and we've talked about that in Acts chapter 2, Mark chapter 16, that we take part in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We read that in, in uh, Romans chapter 6, and as part of that, says that our old man dies when we are buried with Christ in baptism and that we are raised a new life. We are a, we are a new person in Jesus Christ. We are born again when we come out of the waters of baptism, that we are baptized into Christ. <clears throat> what does that mean? That means we are a part of Christ. Our life is hidden in Christ. Romans 6, Galatians 3 we are beneficiaries of all the spiritual blessings that are in Jesus. We read that in Ephesians chapter 1. We are added to his body. We are, are his church and his kingdom when we are baptized into Christ. And we are clothed in him. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. You have been clothed in Christ. We are a new creation. That's what we're talking about. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 tells us that in Christ we are a new creation. We are a new person. We are a, a different person that's be, been created in Jesus Christ. And all of these things we go, hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Look at all the things that God has done for us through Jesus. Look at this new life that we have been given. We have been given a new identity in Jesus Christ. We're not the old person anymore. He has given us a new name. We are called by his name. We are a Christian. We are Christ-like. We are a Christian. <clears throat> Our name is written in heaven, the scripture tells us. And now we have a new citizenship. We are citizens of heaven. <clears throat> Praise the Lord for all of these things. How exciting is it to have a new life in Jesus Christ? It is very exciting. <clears throat> but how do we navigate how do we navigate the transition? Because you know what happens is we have all this excitement about being a new person in Christ. But you know, when the, the initial excitement wears off, guess what? We're, we're still living in the same town. We're living in the same house. We've got the same stuff around us. We've got the same people around us. How do we navigate this change that God has made in us and is bringing about in us? to live and become the person that God wants us to be. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. So this is where we're going to spend our time. I thank Raleigh for the reading of the morning. This is sort of, sort of a parallel, so parallel verses to what Paul wrote to the Romans there in Romans chapter 13. We also read a very similar 
very similar passage in Ephesians chapter 4. So if you want to write those things down and go and compare the verses there, they're very similar. The themes are very similar uh, in, those, in those chapters. But we're going to spend our time this morning in Colossians chapter 3, where Paul says, if you, if you, Then you were raised with Christ. Seek those things which are above where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on the things of the earth. So Paul starts off here by saying, if then you were raised with Christ, and that's a rhetorical question, because if you are a Christian, you are raised with Christ. We've already talked about that. When were we raised with Christ? When we were buried with Him in baptism, when we obeyed the gospel and we were raised from those waters to in newness of life. We were raised with Christ. We have a new life in Christ, with Christ. So we are indeed raised with Christ. <clears throat> He said, that being the case, seek the things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Change your focus. See, the, ch the change of, the, of becoming a new person means that we have to have a new mindset. We have to change our focus. Before, we were just focused on the things of this world. Now our focus is on the things of God, the things of Christ. You know, we're reminded of the words of Jesus in Matthew um, chapter 5 where he tells us seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all of these things these these material things will be taken care of these are the things that the Gentiles seek after these are the earthly things they're worried about you don't worry be worried about those things anymore set your affections on the things of heaven on the kingdom of God so change your focus change your mindset to knowing and doing what the will of God is he said, set your minds on things above and not on the things of this earth. Elevate your thinking. It's not merely just daydreaming. It's not daydreaming about heaven, but it's a change of direction. It's a change of where our goal is. Our goal is in serving Christ, becoming the person that Christ wants us to be. Setting our mind on spiritual things rather than earthly things. On Jesus' authority, his words, and his teaching. <clears throat> you know, Jesus tells us that the great two commandments are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, also your, your strength and your mind. With all of our being, we love God. And, and the second is likened to it, love your neighbor as yourself. That these are the things we are focused on as a new person in Christ Jesus. For you died. You died. Do you remember dying? <laughs> remember the funeral? <clears throat> Paul says that you died. When did we die? When we were baptized into Christ. We were baptized into his death. Romans chapter 6 says, Knowing that this, our, our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Paul says you died. Your old person died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. We have a new life. And that new life is hidden with Christ in God. It's no longer my life. It's his, his life. The scripture tells us that we are credited in Christ with the righteousness of Christ. God doesn't see those filthy rags anymore. When he sees us, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. We have been credited with the righteousness of Christ in this new life that we live. What a tremendous blessing that is for us. And when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, you died. Christ is now your life. Your life is Jesus Christ. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? That's a, what a tremendous blessing. I don't want to be. I would much rather be Jesus than my whole self. That's what I want to be. I want to be like him. And Paul says... He is your life. You know, we were reminded of the words of Paul in Galatians chapter 2. I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Christ is your life. <clears throat> and when Christ who is our life shall appear... <clears throat> Then you also will appear with him in glory. You know, the theme, the powerful themes of God's plan in the New Testament are repeated over and over. What is it that we look forward to? At the, to the time when we will know Christ eternally. 
beyond this veil of tears, beyond this land of trials and temptations and troubles and difficulty. We see beyond that to what we, we were baptized into Christ for, for eternal life, for eternity with Jesus. And Jesus is going to reappear and we're going to be glorified with him. We're going to appear in his glory when he returns. So Paul is saying, elevate your thinking. Get your mind off of this earthly thing and get your mind on spiritual things. Mind the things that are most important. In the writing to Romans that, that Riley read this morning, it says, the time is at hand. The night is far spent. It's time. Quit wasting time. With the earthly things, get your mind on the spiritual things, on the heavenly things. <clears throat> Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desires, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. <clears throat> Therefore, Paul says, put to death your members which are on the earth. But I thought we already died. We did. But you know what? That old man died. That old man doesn't want to stay dead. <clears throat> that old man wants to be resurrected. You know, and we, we are in the struggle. <clears throat> I was telling Brother Warren this morning, he said, how are you? I said, I'm in the struggle. We're both in the struggle. We're all in the struggle. We're in the struggle together and we're in the struggle with Christ. <clears throat> but you know, when I, I remember when I was... A young man, I was working out in the oil field, and there was, we had a fire, and, and we, we went out, and we were putting out fires, and, and we had help from the local fire people, and, you know, we'd get all those fires put out, but you'd, as it got dark, you'd see these little embers burning here and there, and you'd have to go back and, and douse them down again to try to get those things to go out, those mesquites. You know, that's kind of what it's like when we're putting to death the old person. That old person doesn't want to stay dead. It wants to keep popping up. But Paul uses some very strong language here for us. And he says, you put to death. These are not things that we trifle with that he's talking about concerning the old man. Because if we allow them, those things will distract us. They will take us away from the person, that, from becoming the person that God wants us to be. And so... Paul says you don't mess around with these things. You kill these things that, and you don't allow them, you don't allow them to survive in your mind because that's the battlefield. The battlefield of these things is in our mind and we have to win the battle there. We have to throw these things out or cast these things off. We have to put these things to death. And he talks about specifically, and this is not a list in, in its entirety, but this is some of the certain things that certainly was a problem for those at, at, in, at Colossae. And if we look around us today, it's a problem in the world today. He said, you put, away, you put to death these things, fornication, that sexual relations outside of marriage, uncleanness, spiritual impurity. And when you look at Romans chapter 1 and some of the things there that God just, that Paul describes concerning the Gentile people. That's some of the things that are kind of identified here in this word uncleanness. Passion, um, sinful desires, evil desires, sexual desires that are unlawful, covetousness, greed, wanting more and more, which, which Paul says is idolatry because in, our, in greed we are placing the value of something above our, our value of God. We are, that's becoming our, our thing that we worship because we desire it so greatly. He says, you kill these things, put all of these things to death. 1 Peter chapter 2 and 11 says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. What does he say? These things are your enemy. <clears throat> We are in a spiritual battle. We are in a spiritual warfare. Whether we like it or not, we have always been in a spiritual battle. Before, but when we became a Christian, we changed sides. We went from being a prisoner of war to a free person in Christ. And we are engaged in the battle, and that battle is fought internally 
with our flesh because the, the scripture says our flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh so that we cannot do the things that we would. Our flesh would try to pull us away from the spiritual things and we have to fight that battle because it's a war against our soul. We're at, we're at battle with our own flesh. We are at battle with the prince of this world, that being Satan, who walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's always looking for those opportunities to find a foothold in our lives. And if we don't, we have to kill these things so we don't allow him a foothold. <clears throat> and we, the other battle we have is against the world. <clears throat> the other thing that, is, that we struggle against is, is against the world because that all that is in the world, the lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life in the world would try to seduce us and try to influence us. And if you look around the world today and you look at the things that Paul says put to death, these are the things that are glorified in the world. These are the things that are marched with pride in defiance of God. <clears throat> you look at all the, these things in the world and all these things that Paul says you put to death, the world would try to make those things normalized. And those things okay. And we have to put those things to death in our lives. We cannot because we are in this spiritual battle. It says because of these things the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. God is going to punish these things. <clears throat> and we don't want these things in our lives. When, a when God's wrath is poured out on those the ch as he calls the children of disobedience. The sons of disobedience. Don't be named among them in which you yourselves also walked in them in the past. Again, this was a part of the old man, part of those old sinful clothes that we were wearing. And Paul saying, you cast them off and you burn them. <laughs> you kill them. You kill those things. Don't let them have any place in your life. But now you yourselves also put off these things. Casting off these, like we're again, we're casting off clothes. <clears throat> put off these things. Put off anger, put off wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you have put off the old man and his deeds. We're casting these things off. They were a part of us before. They can't, they have no place in our new life in Christ. We have to control our emotions. He talks specifically about anger. In Ephesians, he talks about be angry and sin not. We all have a natural tendency. We all have anger. Jesus had anger. But be angry and sin not. Don't allow that emotion to take us to a place where we don't need to go, which will bring us to commit sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't stew on things. Get that anger out. Deal with it. <clears throat> wrath. That's deep-seated anger. You know, that's, that's, how, that's, that's the word that described how those were when Jesus was... Um, preaching there and he was he opened their eyes to certain things and they wanted to take him out of town and throw him off a cliff <laughs> it said that in their wrath this is what they sought to do that's you he said you don't have any part of that don't have that deep-seated anger that leads to sin in our lives he says malice that that's the desire to end the intent to injure someone else to gratify our anger and our wrath then he talks about controlling our tongue. He talks about blasphemy or, and other, I think the King James uh, interprets that as, as railing. So that's where we're, we're talking evil about other people in our anger and our wrath. We're, we're bad-mouthing people. Or we're, it, they use the word, it's the same word as is used for blasphemy. If we, have that, if we talk about God that way, either way, it's a very sinful thing. He says, you, you cast these things off. That's the old man. That's the old desires of the flesh. And he said, you don't have any part with those. You, you cast those off. You control <clears throat> your tongue. He says, don't, he said, filthy language. And we're talking, you know, we're talking about obscenities or filthy talk or, or dirty jokes or just obscene language, in, you know, to, to gain attention or whatever. He said, that's no part of you. That part you has no part in Christ. You get rid of this. You cast it off. You throw it away. You burn it. You don't lie to each other. You're honest with each other. Our life is honesty, is transparency. 
<clears throat> we don't exaggerate. Jesus said, let your yes be yes and your no be no, and that's sufficient, <clears throat> but we don't lie. So all of these things, he says, you cast them off. Because what? Because you put on the new man. Those were all part of the old person. As we become a new person in Christ, we have to understand that repentance means change, and all of these things are a part of that change. As our new person in Christ, we're going to cast these things off. We're going to kill them. We're going to put them to death. We're going to burn them because we're putting on a new person that's renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. We've put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. There's a parallel verse in Galatians chapter 3 that you're familiar with. And it says this, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, the image of him who created him. The new man that we're putting on is Christ. The new man that we're putting on, it's a new person, but that person is put on in the image of of him who created him, the image of Christ. We have put on Christ. <clears throat> and this is the key. This is the key to understanding our new person, that Christ is all in all. He is our all in all. It's no longer about me. It's about Christ. You know, our culture and our society tells us and tells our young people, be the person that you want to be. Go out and live your dream. Fulfill your dreams. It's all about you. It's all about being who you want to be. <clears throat> but the Bible tells us something very different. The, top, the Bible says you don't want to be that person. The person you want to be is Christ. The person you want to be is a new person who's formed after the image of Christ, who's, who's, who God is going to mold and make as we allow him to into the image of his son in whom, whose life we are hidden and, in, and whose life is, who, and that, that he is our life. It's no longer about me, but it's all about Jesus. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also do you. He starts out by reminding us, of who we are, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved. We in Christ Jesus are the elect of God. You know, that, that phrase was kind of reserved under the Old Testament for the Jewish people, the children of Israel, but not the physical Israel. It was really the spiritual Israel because that's who we are. We are the spiritual Israel. We are the spiritual descendants of Abraham. We are the spiritual uh, and, uh, heirs of the promises that God gave to Abraham, that, those promises being found in Jesus Christ. We are called into Christ. We are called into his body, the church. We are in him holy and we are beloved of God. He says, put on these things, tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. Whose qualities are these? In whose life do we see these qualities? We see them in, in him and who is our life. And that is in Christ. Tender mercies is a compassionate heart, a heart of compassion. <clears throat> you know, we look at the life of Jesus and what did he have for people? He had a heart of compassion. And he taught us in the parable of the Good Samaritan how to be a compassionate person. When we see someone in need that we help them, we have compassion on others. We see every person as a, as a creation of God, one for whom Christ died and we have love for that person. We have compassion for that person. He talks about kindness, and we look at the kindness that is displayed in the life of Jesus. We look at the woman at the well who was surprised when Jesus, who was a Jew, would even talk to her. <clears throat> we, are, we are called to be, have kindness like Jesus has kindness, humility. Jesus took upon himself the form of a servant, and finding himself in the form of a servant, he humbled himself and became obedient even to the point of death and even the death of the cross. Jesus is our example for humility, eternal God who became human and took on himself the form of a servant and walked this life and this earth humbly in obedience to God. And that's the God the Father. And that 
is our example, to, be, to have humility, to have meekness, power with constraint. Look at the life of Jesus, who when he was on the cross could have called for a legion of angels. He had the power to do that, but he was restrained by the will of God to do the will of God, to secure our salvation. Meekness, humbling, having a meek spirit, to having power with constraint bridled by the, by the will of God in our lives. <clears throat> Bearing with one another and forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so also you must do, or also you also must do. It's not a may do, it's not a might do, it's you must do. And this is important. This is very important for us. He says that we're bearing, we have to bear with one another. Robin has a a cup towel that she recently purchased in her house and it says, I love you more today than yesterday. And then in parentheses it says, you got on my nerves yesterday. (laughs) So... And that's, you know, I think about Monty's lessons given before about warts and all. I mean, we all have warts. We all get on each other's nerves. We all have things that we may not like about each other. Sometimes we're too opinionated. Sometimes we are immature. Sometimes we are hypocrites. But Paul says you bear with each other because we're all in the struggle Together, we're all struggling in the flesh to become like Jesus. And so we have to bear with each other. We have to help each other in this. And when we offend each other, we have to be forgiving to each other. We have to, we have to be gracious with one another, just as Jesus is gracious with us. We look, at, we look at the long-suffering of Christ towards his apostles, and you look at the apostles as Jesus is leading them around in his time here upon this earth and what were they always concerned about who's going to be which one of us is going to be the greatest which one of us gets to sit on the right hand or the left hand they didn't get it they didn't understand the kingdom of God Jesus was very bearing with them he was forbearing he was long suffering for them you know eventually they got it eventually they would get it and they got it hopefully eventually if we haven't got it we will get it But this is a big part of getting it. Understand that we are in this together. And none of us are perfect. And we have to help and be forgiving and encouraging one to another. Paul says, this is something as Christ forgave you, you must do. You must also do that. But above all these, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And all of these things... The scripture tells us that God is love and that love never fails. And when we love God with all of our being and when we love our neighbor as ourselves, we fulfilled all the law and the prophets. In 1 Corinthians the 13, when it talks about love in these descriptions, it says it's long-suffering, it's kind, it doesn't envy, it doesn't show off, it's not prideful, it's not rude, it's not selfish, it's not defensive. It does not think evil. It rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, endures all things. It never fails. And that is the description of the character of Jesus Christ. Whom we are trying, whom we are putting on and whom we are imitating. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which you were also called in one body and be ye thankful. Let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Allow the peace of God to rule in your hearts who has called us to peace in Jesus Christ. Peace with Him. We can be at peace with ourselves. We can be at peace with others and we're called in one body, that being the body of Christ. And He says you do this with thanksgiving. And finally, in verses 16 and 17, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatsoever you do, indeed, in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Jesus Christ is our all in all. He is the life which we live. It is Him in whom we are clothed. It is Him whom we are imitating and growing into the image of. 
And Paul, in this, these not concluding verses, but concluding of our lesson this morning, says, as a new creation in Christ, we need to study God's word. We need to sing God's praise. We need to give, do God's will. And we need to give God thanks. Hopefully there's something this morning that will be encouraging to you as we, in the struggle together, strive to become like Christ, knowing the assurances that he's given us of all the blessings that we have in him and the promises that we will inherit in him. Let us do that with joy. Never knowing the minds of those present, if you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, if you've never been buried with him in baptism, if we can assist you this morning with that, or if we can assist you with, with prayers or in any way, we invite you to come forward while we stand and sing the song that's been selected. <clears throat>